Oh, what do you think about the ice cream? Oh, <laughs> can I use a spoon? Mmm, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have a bite? Or you want to have a spoon, huh? Mmm. <laughs> you want some of mine? Oh. <laughs> Well, you can't beat starting a Bible study with a little ice cream, can you? I was hallied this afternoon on a warm day in Taos, New Mexico. Probably a little warm where you are as well. And I'm glad that uh, you, my friends, are here as we come tonight into our First Timothy Bible study here on uh, session number seven. A delight to have you. We'll get in, or started into Bible study here in just a moment. And uh, again, uh, quite the blessing to have you here. Thank you very much. And uh, at the end of the broadcast, I will... Uh, say some greetings. So I would love it if you would uh, put in your name in town, perhaps, uh, and uh, I'll say hi to you at the end of the broadcast. We'll have a little fellowship together. How about some ice cream? We could have some ice cream together and uh, just uh, chat a little bit and maybe answer a question or two if you've got any, and that will be a delight. Thanks for being here for Bible study. Got the outline available, I think. Is that correct, Nathan? Um, he says the outline is almost available on the website. Uh, it uh, is available on the RWM Connect page, and you can use that uh, to follow along, or you can use it uh, later on and uh, uh, as a uh, resource. So tonight, with no further ado, let's rightly divide the word. Let's get into uh, 1 Timothy today. And uh, we, uh, again, are here in session number seven. We come to chapter three, verses one through 10, and our verse by verse uh, through Timothy. You may remember uh, that uh, even though we're beginning in chapter three, this seg section that we're on is the third part of a charge. The uh, charge in chapter one, verse 18, and let me uh, just take us there. As uh, Paul says in 118, this charge I commit unto thee. What charge are we talking about? This charge I commit unto thee. Well, I said we're talking about uh, the charge that uh, begins, and now we've looked at uh, 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 two of them. First of all, in chapter two, verse one is charge number one. I exhort thee. And he begins to talk about uh, prayer and worship, if you will, uh, from uh, chapter two, verse uh, one, going down to verse eight. And then in verse nine, he says, in like manner. And last week, we looked at 9 through 18 of chapter 2, and he talks about uh, women and the behavior of women and the role of women in our society today. And notice I put all this in blue letters. If you're new with us, uh, our blue letter attempt is an attempt, our blue letter edition is an attempt to uh, take some... Uh, discernment of the scripture in rightly dividing and determine that which is holy Pauline, which means you and I can apply it directly to our lives, our Christian life, our churches, our families today, and not have any danger of putting ourselves back under the law. And one of the reasons uh, we made this blue, by the way, is here in uh, chapter two, I exhort, therefore, this is a Pauline command. So we put it to us. So uh, I charge thee. Charge number one is chapter two, verses one through eight. Charge number two is chapter two, verses nine through uh, uh, 18, nine through 15. Now we come to charge number three, which begins in First Timothy chapter three, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. Uh, if we uh, if we stick by the outline, we won't make it quite all the way through this. There's uh, there there's a little too much to put into one, a little uh, too uh, too little to separate into two. So we'll just 
slice it at the end of the page. How's that sound? Uh, as a matter of fact, on the uh, outline, I uh, spilled over a little bit uh, into the third page. I usually try to keep it to two pages because I know about how much I talk uh, and that two pages fills an hour quite well. Uh, so let's, uh, with no further ado, as I've already said, let's get into it. As Paul says, this is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. This is is a true saying. The word true is the uh, word uh, uh, pistis. Actually, uh, let me uh, get this to the uh, right place here. As you remember, we've got the King James. That'll be our basis. We've got the uh, Newberry interlinear, and then we've got uh, the uh, Young's literal right here. So pistis is the word. In fact, it's the priority word, which means uh, that that's the emphasis. Now, pistis is the word for faith. So faithful in the Newberry or steadfast over here in the Young's literal, true. Now, it is used uh, later on, I believe it's in verse 15. No, it's in chapter 1, verse 15, that you have uh, the word pistis uh, used in much the same manner where it says this is a faithful saying. Here, this is a true saying. Uh, as you know, King James, again, tried to... Uh, give a little variety because it was uh, for the for the ear to be spoken. This is a true saying. Faithful is this saying. Now, not saying like proverb, you know, where we would say, "Hey, there's this old saying," but saying as what I'm about to tell you is absolutely faithful. It is absolutely true. You can bank on this. You don't need to worry about this. Uh, and so, it really, I think it's a. Uh, saying this, introducing it this way, this is a true saying, was a means of saying, let's, uh, let, let me emphasize the point. You and I do it all the time. You and I uh, might uh, come along and uh, we've been talking of truth for a long time and hopefully the whole speech we've been talking truth and then we'll say, now let me tell you the truth. What? You haven't been telling us the truth? No, I've been telling you the truth. I'm emphasizing that this is a true, faithful saying. Paul wants this emphasized, so I think you and I ought to stop and spend a little bit of emphasis on this true saying. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A man. If a man desire the office <coughs> of a bishop. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, when you uh, look over here, uh, it doesn't actually have the word man, anthropos or anair, depending on which one it's used. It has just a, a, a personal pronoun and an indefinite personal pronoun at that. Here, it's translated any. If any, we might say if anyone. Now, it is in the masculine, and granted that that is an appropriate way of saying anyone, male or female. So why did the King James say, if a man? The truth is that even though this particular pronoun and this particular uh, phrase right here could be anyone, as soon as we get, say, to verse 2, he's got to be the husband of one wife, or literally that's the word man, the man of one wife, it, it, it limits anyone to the masculine in its specific sense. So, though grammatically it is correct to do, for example, as the, uh, as the Youngs has done, if anyone on the oversight doth long for, anyone, uh, then uh, for a right work, he desireth. They did do the he, uh, a, a one, one, a, a, of one wife, a husband. You really can't put anyone if the ladies are not included. He's already talked about the ladies. He doesn't allow a lady to teach. So uh, I, think, I think the King James here is absolutely the way you've got to translate it. That's why I use a King James Bible, and so should you. But uh, here, again, if you back up a few verses, uh, Paul is saying, I suffer not a woman to teach. 
Now, he says, if anyone in the masculine, it's got to be a man, because here he says the man of one woman or the husband of one wife, as we'll talk about in a moment. So uh, I am convinced that the office of a bishop is limited to men only. If I was God, would I have done it that way? I don't know. I do a lot of dreaming about if I was God, and it uh, turns out that it's best I'm not. All I know is that, even as we talked about last week, there is God-given, there are God-given roles in society that God has established for our own good. Let's just leave it at that. We live in a fallen world. It looks like these uh, positions are given because of the fall, and they uh, keep some semblance of order in a fallen world. So let's just go for it. Rather than arguing with the word of God, uh, let's, just, uh, let's just take it and leave it right there. So if a man desire the office of a bishop, the office of a bishop uh, comes from the word, uh, as uh, we'll see again in chapter uh, 3, uh, episcopes, episcopes. Uh, of course, we hear Episcopalian in that, uh, and uh, it has to do with uh, church governance, although I would argue that the Episcopalians uh, don't uh, do exactly as he's saying here. But nonetheless, uh, they take it from that word, obviously. Episcopes uh, is the word. Now, an Episcopes is literally, it comes from uh, the, the word episc Episcopes, uh, is, our, is, is from the word episcope, episcope. Now, episcope is epi upon, epi upon, and scope is literally the scope. You know, you take and uh, say, okay, uh, what is it that is in view? What is it that I am able to see? The episcope, upon the, the scope or upon and an overlooking upon a view that is taking place, episcope. Now, often the word episcope then is, uh, is translated as an overseer. You know, New American Standard does uh, overseer. Or Young's Literal again, it just says the oversight. If anyone the oversight doth long for, the ep ep episcope doth long for. Now, uh, the overseer is definitely, that's what episcopy means. It's an overseer. The oversight in the, in the means in which it is, uh, because, uh, it is speaking of, uh, it's, it's in a noun here. And so even though the word office is not there, you got to do something with the form of the verb. So the oversight or the office of, the role of, the position of, the episcope. Get up on top where you can oversee the whole thing. That's the meaning of the word. So uh, so why not put overseer, for example, as New American Standard has done, and probably, I didn't look, but probably uh, many, many of the uh, translations use the uh, word overseer. Uh, I actually think that office of a bishop is a very good translation of it. Uh, Episcope, the oversight, the office of a bishop was the best translation, especially in 1611, uh, that uh, the uh, bishop's office was, was the overseer. And he was the overseer of a local congregation. And this is what it's talking about. Probably today we would, we would use the word pastor. If anyone desires the office of the pastor, he desireth a good work. Now let's talk about this right here, the office of a bishop. I have often said when we speak about the Bible, we should use Bible speak. That is to say, when we're talking about biblical things, let's use biblical terminology. The word here is bishop, and yet you and I, in the circles that we run in, we, probably very few of us, actually use the term bishop. The Bible uses the term bishop. We don't use the term bishop. Should we use the term bishop? I think that uh, the body of Christ really would benefit from having a good discussion uh, about what do you call the preacher? 
I will tell you that even through the rest of this, uh, this Bible study tonight, I'm going to use a number of terms. I'll talk, talk about the preacher. It's one of my favorite. I might uh, talk about the pastor. We're going to see some other terms that are used here. Uh, but as you know, uh, in broader Christendom, D-U-M-B, there is uh, not a, a consensus on what you call that guy. Not only that, but now even in, let's say, evangelicalism and spilling into fundamentalism, there is not a, um, uh, an understanding of what you call that guy. Uh, there used to be, um, and evangelicalism, of course, I grew up in evangelical, uh, now I have left it, I'm a fundamentalist and you should be too, is the name of my little book. Uh, but I grew up in evangelicalism, and in evangelicalism, in the days and in the places where I grew up, you, the, the, the pastor or the preacher was the guy we're talking about here. And everybody, if you said the pastor, they knew what you're talking about. I remember the very first time I heard the term pastor used for someone who in my evangelical conservative upbringing was not a pastor. They were, when, when I went to, uh, uh, well, my first job in a church, uh, other than the custodian in high school, but uh, my first job uh, in a church after I graduated from college and I was going to seminary and I got a part-time job in a church as, as uh, they used to do. Unfortunately, they don't do that anymore. And they graduate from the seminary and never even taught a Sunday school class. They, it's, a, it's a pitiful situation, but I won't go there. My first job was as what we called the youth director. The youth director worked under the pastor. Uh, he was the boss. I'd go to him. I'd get his guidance, all that kind of stuff. And I directed the youth. So they called me the youth director. Now, uh, after, uh, after that, I, uh, I, I took another, uh, role on, uh, on the staff, uh, and, I uh, was the singles director for a while. And eventually, I became the pastor. I did not view myself as the pastor until I was the guy that gave the youth director his guidance. I was the guy that gave the oversight. I was the guy that stood up every Sunday morning at the pulpit and said, now I'd like you to open your Bibles too. And uh, the church would follow and I gave oversight. I was, that's when I said I was a pastor. Now, prior to that, I was a, uh, I was in ministry. Uh, for about five years, honestly, uh, uh, full and part time. I was in ministry, but I was always, you know, directing something. Now, uh, about the year 2000, so I was in my second pastorate. I was the pastor of First Baptist Church in Kaufman, Texas. And I was working on a doctorate degree and I was in a doctoral seminar. And uh, I remember a fella from California who used the word, those Californians, you got to watch them, right, Shirley? Uh, and I remember, uh, him using the term pastor, but he was not talking about this guy. He was talking about the youth director, the music director, the singles director, or something, you know, and, and, uh, he kind of got a little, uh, bent out of shape because a lot of us were Southerners and we were, we were looking at him like, why, why do you call, you know, call yourself a pastor? You're not the pastor. Uh, and, and it became a thing. Now, all of that to say, that was the year 2000. Obviously, this is the year 2021. In these 21 years where it was a new thing then, at least in my culture, now in these 21 years, they absolutely, they as in evangelicalism, don't know what to call that guy or gal. Everybody is pastor of something, pastor of the green-eyed stepchildren, whatever it is that they are in this church. And if you call a church today, uh, you know, especially a larger one, a multi-staff church, and you say, may I speak to the pastor? Their question is going to be, which one? Which one? We don't know who the pastor is around here, I guess. Which one would you like to talk to? Now, uh, I think it would do evangelicalism well. 
It would do the right division community, the grace community, the grace movement well. It would do all of Christendom well to stop a little bit and say, what do we call this guy? Well, what's the word? Uh, we could we could call him um, uh, preacher. I like preacher. It's a biblical term, actually. Second Timothy, uh, excuse me, First Timothy chapter two verse seven and Second Timothy chapter one verse eleven. Paul calls himself a preacher. Second uh, Peter chapter two verse five. Peter calls Noah a preacher. Now, it's a little bit obviously out of our dispensation, but we, you know, a preacher is someone who heralds. We could use the term preacher. Uh, we could use the term pastor. I use it all the time. It's probably the most common word for this guy is pastor. And yet, pastor is a pastoral word. It really is a shepherding word. It comes from the word poimen, uh, and poimen is shepherd. And uh, pastor came from the word shepherd. I, it's my view that shepherd, sheep, shepherding issues in the scripture, Old and New Testament, actually belong to Israel. So though pastor is the most common, probably if we were to have this big old meeting, uh, and uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the big old meeting about what to call the guy that preaches on Sunday morning, what do we call that guy? I probably would vote against pastor, even though, let me tell you, I'll probably keep on using it because that's what everyone uses. It's hard for one guy to change everything, isn't it? Pastor, uh, bishop, we could use the word bishop. And uh, those of us who use the King James, of course, we're used to it. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. Bishop, we could call him. Now, uh, bishop actually has a few things going for it. And some things, some strong things going against it. Uh, one of the things going for it is it is a biblical term. And uh, here in the King James Bible, you got it right there, a bishop. So most, most people who use the King James don't use the term bishop. Most of them will call it something else. In fact, I've never been in a King James only church that ever called their pastor or preacher the bishop. It is a biblical term. Interestingly enough, uh, the word bishop actually comes directly from the Greek episkopos. Uh, what, what it uh, does is take that word or episco uh, episcope. Uh, what it does on episcope is drop, uh, drop the, um, uh, the, 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 the last two. Now, this is not the root word here, uh, but uh, if I can do this without getting in the way, and if you can read uh, Greek, then it's piskop, piskop. Ah, that sounds an awful lot like bishop. And that's exactly where the word, it morphed from one language to another language. Uh, and uh, P, the P became a B. That is very common in, in transferring in one language uh, to another. And the uh, sk, sk sound, biscop, was softened a little bit. That's off, all, all, also very common, especially if it goes by the way of French, which this word did. Uh, bishop uh, uh, came from the Greek via the French, and it became uh, a little softer in the middle. And, and bishop is episkopos, piscop, bishop. There's the word. So it, the bishop really has a lot going for it, it's the closest English equivalent to the word episkopos. Now, the problem is that for hundreds and hundreds of years, the word bishop has been associated especially with Catholicism and Anglicanism. And those in the free church uh, tradition, like probably most of us, are a little bit allergic to things that sound Catholic, things that sound Anglican or Episcopalian, with uh, apologies to our friend in friends in England, but they're probably not Anglican. 
Uh, so, you know, th- there's, there's, a, there's the issue with bishop. Hey, it's probably the most biblical word. It's probably the most offensive word. So we're kind of stuck with this. There's a few other words, minister. Uh, I don't, I don't know of a place, I may be wrong, but I don't know of a place in the Bible where minister is used as a title and referring to this guy. Uh, this guy does minister, but minister is used much more broadly and in terms of church, typically uh, coming from diakonos, not episkopos. Minister uh, is a possibility. It's used in more, uh, uh, typically, either Church of Christ or a little more left-leaning, Church Christ is not typically left-leaning, but they use minister. And then the other group that uses it would be, uh, for example, Disciples of Christ, which are uh, is a break-off of the Church of Christ and is a little more left-leaning. Uh, reverend. How about reverend? Uh, the problem with reverend, it's a Latin term that means to stand in awe or to stand in respect. Uh, it is, like bishop, distasteful to most of us in the free church tradition, and we're not going to use reverend. In addition to that, it really flips over the word episkopos rather than the bishop is one who overlooks, the reverend is one who stands and they look at him. That's, I'm not going for reverend. Skip reverend, for me anyway. I'd rather be called a bishop. Uh, in the King James biblical sense of the word, be called a bishop. Probably in the meantime, personally, I'll go with the preacher. Uh, and um, nonetheless, all that to say, let's say that was a long discussion. No wonder we won't get through the whole section tonight, right? Uh, but all that to say, there, you know, what's the scripture Paul gives about uh, a trumpet that doesn't sound a clear sound? And the church sort of got the same issue. They don't even know what to call the guy in charge, if I can use that term. Who's that guy? He's the lead pastor. He's the senior pastor. He's the uh, head coach. He's the, uh, he's the bishop. He's the reverend. He's the most reverend doctor. He's the whatever he is. I don't know what we call him. It would do the church some good. And again, the same uh, among... Uh, uh, the right dividers, it would do us some good to say, hey, let's get this uh, figured out. Now, uh, with that, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Paul has no animosity whatsoever to a man desiring the office. I have said many, many times, and so we won't spend much time on it, but I disregard the whole uh, idea of having some mysterious spiritual call. I think that um, the church ought to call out young men for this office. I think that the church ought to um, uh, carry out this office in such a way that it is desirable that young men will grow up in the church and say, I desire the office of a bishop. Now, for the bishop, let me say also, he desireth a good work. It is a work. It's not uh, for freeloaders. This is a good work. And uh, Paul would say, hey, if you don't work, don't eat. And you got to work anyway. So here's a good work. And uh, Paul gives no animosity of that at all. Now, verses two and three, let's put uh, together. And he gives kind of a list here. And it's just a bullet list, as I've given you even on the outline. And uh, uh, quick list, lightning round here that he goes through these boom, 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 boom. Let me tell you these things. And he seems to feel no need for further commentary. That's a little too much for me. I'm going to give a little bit of commentary, but I am going to be try to be somewhat true to the spirit of this, where I think Paul is saying, you know, these things are self-evident. You don't need to look up in the Oxford English Dictionary to figure out what all these are. Uh, you, you already know them, and so all I got to do is spit it out. There's really no need to for a discussion. You, you remember how sometimes, uh, you know, when your kids are growing up and you you tell them no. 
and uh, they start to argue with you or whatever, and you say, what part of no do you not understand? These, this, this is that kind of list. It's, it's again, uh, self-explanatory and uh, doesn't need much commentary. So I'll give the commentary, I'll try to keep the commentary uh, to a minimum. He says, the bishop must be blameless. The word there actually means nothing will stick to him. He's Teflon. Now, the reason that uh, nothing will stick to him and nothing can be put on him, there's really no accusation. He lives above board. He lives in such a way that people know, ah, he's a trustworthy guy. He's blameless. Uh, so, so there's a lack of suspicion about his life. I wonder what he does when he's not here, you know, that kind of thing. Nothing, there's nothing there that you would charge. You say, hey, I know this guy's a worker. I know he loves the Lord. I know he loves his wife. Uh, I, you know, I know he loves me, all that kind of stuff. It's, he's blameless. Uh, he is the husband of one wife. Now, you know that the word, uh, husband and wife in Greek are, there, there is no word for husband and wife. Uh, it, there's the word a man and a woman. And a man is sometimes a husband. Husband, again, is a word that we have in the English language that we have to uh, discern when is it talking. So literally, it is the man of one woman. Now, I think that uh, there is really, I'll say, zero chance that Paul was speaking about polygamy here. He wasn't talking about polygamy. Polygamy wasn't really even a thing when Paul. Now, you know, if this had been in the Old Testament, maybe we'd say, hey, this is outlawing uh, polygamy. But it's not. In Judaism, in uh, the Greco-Roman world, there just wasn't this thing going on of polygamy during uh, that point. I think uh, he uh, is... Uh, uh, you know, definitely saying that uh, he's a one-woman man, but uh, I, I think the the only way really to uh, translate to to interpret this is to say he's not divorced. He's not divorced. Uh, I know that God is a God of grace. I know that God forgives uh, divorce, uh, but I also know that a woman is not allowed to teach. What's up with that? If a woman's not allowed to teach, can God not say? And a divorced man's not allowed to be a pastor. He can, he can have another good work, and there's lots of good works he can do. I, I, I think we uh, just uh, ought to, again, take it just for, for the plain sense of it. He should be vigilant. Uh, the word that's used there is one for watchful. He is an overseer, after all. He should be sober. The word sober uh, here doesn't so much have to do with alcohol as we typically use it today, uh, but it's a little broader than that. It's just self-controlled. He should be self-controlled. Uh, then he should be of good behavior. This term here, in fact, there's a, a, a marginal note, modest. Uh, the actual Greek word, we talked about it last, last week, cosmois. Uh, and uh, in chapter 2, when it was speaking uh, of women, it, it uh, was translated modest. Okay, he should be of good behavior. That is, he should be modest. Given to hospitality, then, is the next word. And given to hospitality literally is... Um, uh, let's uh, pull up the Greek word, uh, philoxenos, philoxenos. Philo is to love and xenos is a stranger. We have the word xenophobia, those who are afraid of strangers. Rather than a xenophobia, he's supposed to have a philoxenos or a xenophilo, a love for strangers. So, so I think given to hospitality is a good way to uh, put... Uh, uh, put that, uh, that he's, he's got love for those he doesn't know. You know, that's something that is so valuable for a preacher. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as a young man, I was scared of people I didn't know. I was, I would run from people I didn't know. I was shy from people I didn't know. I really had to work through that because 
Uh, one, because it's a good thing for anybody to work through. This is something that most young people, there are a few young people that just instantly love everybody, but most young people uh, have to work through this. You know, they're a little shy when they're around someone, and I, I had to uh, work through this. Uh, and you can grow, really all of these, you can grow to become uh, to the point you say, you know, there's a fellow over there I don't know. I'd like to go across the room and shake, shake his hand, introduce myself, get to know this fella. Uh, given to hospitality, he has a love for people he doesn't know. Uh, good good uh, job, uh, a good characteristic, wouldn't you say, of a pastor. And the pastor is apt to teach, apt to teach. That is, he has an aptitude to teach. He has the ability to teach. And honestly, if uh, someone simply can't teach and can't be taught how to teach, is not teachable on teachableness, uh, uh, then it shouldn't be a pastor. He could be something else. He shouldn't be a bishop. He could be something else. But let me say, just like given to hospitality can be learned, so can the aptitude to teach. Uh, it can uh, be learned. It, I, I think it has to do with a teaching mind or a teaching spirit. Everybody doesn't have to be just, uh, you know, a silver-tongued orator, but the man who's a bishop should uh, have a, a mind and a spirit that says, I want to teach. I have never understood pastors who uh, when, uh, you know, they, they get an opportunity to teach or they, maybe they thought they weren't going to have to teach and now they are going to have to teach, uh, you know, some, some change in the schedule or something. And they're just like, Oh man, I got so many things to do. I don't have time to, I don't have time to teach. I don't, why would I? Oh, oh, oh. And I don't understand that. What the bishop is, is to be is one who is apt to teach. They should be raring to go. I can't wait to teach. Give me an opportunity. I'll go there anywhere, anybody, whatever it is. I am going to teach. And uh, that's, a, uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, young man that the church ought to call forward, by the way. Then, not given to wine. As I said, sober is not so much an alcohol word uh, here as it is in our day. Uh, not given to wine. We'll come back to this word in a little bit. Uh, but uh, the word, uh, and we'll come back to it when we get to the deacons, the word is paroinos, paroinos. Now, oinos is the word for wine, and par, or para, is the word to come beside. So you remember uh, so many of those para words uh, that uh, we have uh, that, uh, uh, you know, para kaleo, to come alongside with a call. Uh, so many para words. This is to come alongside wine. What it literally says is the bishop shouldn't come alongside wine. That, uh, that, that is the most accurate translation. We'll add just a little bit to this when we get to the deacons here. Uh, so, not given to wine, no striker. Uh, what in the world is a striker? It's not talking about uh, uh, labor unions at all. It is uh, basically saying he's not violent. He's not a bully. The word, the word is kind of interesting, actually. Uh, uh, the word... Uh, is now I tell you what I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, yeah, the 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 word uh, placates is uh, to to hit somebody. Uh, so <coughs> he's he's again he's not violent. He's not a bully. The other word I want to tell you is brawler. We'll get there in just a moment. Uh, so you know he's not just uh, again um, uh, ready to hit you. It is a good characteristic uh, for a pastor not to uh, just go striking every time. Not greedy of filthy lucre. I can tell you that any translation that doesn't have the word filthy did not adequately translate. Because the Greek word literally says filthy. Lucre, of course, is gain. We might call it ill-gotten gain. Uh, but uh, what what it says is the bishop ought to be one that wants to make a um, uh, a reputable living. 
He wants to earn money in a reputable way, not filthy lucre. Uh, he's patient. The word uh, is patient, gentle, moderate in his behavior. Not a brawler. Uh, brawler, it, it, it's really not looking for a fight. You know, not the guy that's always just, he wakes up every day to trying to get in a fight. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I like, the, the word's kind of interesting here. Ah, uh, maxos, ah, uh, maxos. We get, uh, the A is the negator. So, maxos, he's not supposed to be maxos. Now, this has changed, and I want to be careful how I, uh, how I word this, but uh, the word has changed. Maxos is the root word from which we get the English word macho, not macho. Now, this is not at all saying that you put these together, you know, he's not a striker, he's not bra a brawler, he's not, he's not out there hitting people, he's not, you know, looking for a, looking for a, a fight, macho. But it's, it's in the, uh, it, it's not at all saying your preacher should be kind of feminine. Uh, it's just saying, you know, let's take the worst of this. And again, you want a preacher who's very masculine, but you don't want a preacher who's a bully, who's violent, who is always up for a fight and getting in a fight and literally a fist fight kind of thing. Every now and then a preacher should get in a fist fight, by the way, but not all the time is what it's saying here. Uh, not a brawler, not covetousness. Incidentally, I think when he does get in a fight, he should win. Just my personal opinion. Not covetous. Uh, again, uh, the, the actual word is not a lover of silver. Now, there's the quick list that he goes through. Then in verses 4 through 7, he stops and spends just a little bit more time, still not much, but just a little bit more time on uh, some of these uh, things, feels a need to give a brief explanation, whereas verses 2 and 3 gives no explanation at all. Uh, so the first thing is in verses 4 and 5, I've summarized it on the outline to say he should be a good husband. Uh, he is one that ruleth his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. Uh, because if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? He's got he's to be a good husband. He's got to take care of his own house. He's got to do it well. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to me, starting in verse 5 and then backing up, interesting to me that uh, it takes the word rule right here, which uh, how to rule, one that ruleth, it's the same Greek word. But it doesn't use that for taking care of the church of God. It says take care of rather than rule. There is a different kind of leadership that a pastor gives in his home than he gives in his church. He is not the father uh, of, the, uh, of the church that that, uh, you know, can just command the orders and the children better, you know, obey with some gravity, be in subjection with all gravity. Uh, and uh, that uh, phrase there, in subjection with all gravity, basically says, in the home, his children should know their place and they should respect their place. They know, I don't talk back to dad. They know... I don't, I don't, you know, talk back to mom. I don't, I don't go against the commands. I have my place in this home and I know what it is and I'm going to stay there. Uh, that is to, uh, to, to, um, have your children in subjection, uh, with all gravity. Now, uh, everyone has known and had the question, what about a pastor who's grown children have um, left the faith, let's say, or a pastor whose grown children are, are not a glowing tribute of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that disqualify the pastor? I don't see this. Uh, I, I think that uh, while a pastor's 
home uh, while a pastor is to be in full control of, of, of the behavior of the children in the home and while they're at the home, I think that after they leave the home, the pastor is no more responsible for their behavior than is any other man. And obviously any other man has a, a bit of a, let's say, moral obligation to his grown children. But there comes a time when the child uh, gets old enough and leaves home and they make their own bed and they're going to sleep in it. And that's all you can you can do. But when when the child is in the home, the thing that the pastor needs is to rule his children well. Uh, and if, if he can't handle that, basically, he says he's not going to do this very well uh, for a thousand reasons. Then the second thing he gives that he wants to give a little more commentary on is he says, not a novice, verse six, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, the word uh, novice right here uh, is uh, the word uh, neophutos, neophyte, not a neophyte. Let's see what the uh, marginal note says. Uh, uh, one newly come unto the faith. Uh, so not a novice, not literally a neophyte. Uh, neos is young. Phytos uh, is uh, grow, to grow up. So not one who's still young in the growing up phase. Uh, that would be to say uh, immature, uh, not mature, not there yet, not grown up. Um, in fact, the uh, the English word neophyte today, I suppose it would mostly be used in in all different subjects. A neophyte, somebody who doesn't know know much about something uh, in the English language. And yet, if you look in the dictionary, the primary definition number one is always going to be uh, the, uh, someone who is new to the faith, and and thus the uh, you know not a novice, a neophyte, one newly come to the faith, one who's not grown up much in the faith. That is, a uh, young man might have just come to the Lord, might be uh, eager to be a bishop, but the church says, you know, you're new in the faith. Uh, you need to wait a little bit. You need to uh, serve a little bit. You need to uh, mature a little bit. You need to come to some greater understanding before this happens. Let's help you to do that. Let's watch uh, through. It's a good thing that you desire, but you're not ready yet. So we're going to, uh, you know, help you prepare. We're going to help get you there. It's a very uh, good thing, but uh, a neophyte should not uh, not be a pastor, a novice. Why not? Uh, because they might succumb to pride, be lifted up in pride. We can understand this, you know, why I'm just, uh, you know, uh, uh, 23 years old and I'm the pastor of this grand church. You could, you could be puffed up with pride. There is an aspect of uh, being a preacher in which there's a general amount of praise that comes your way. You stand at the door and you shake hands, so nice to see you today. Oh, that was a marvelous sermon, a marvelous sermon, pastor. And of course, I know they slept through the whole thing. I, you know, you, as, as you get older, you let it go in one ear and out the other. And you know that these are customary greetings you give to uh, to the pastor. Uh, but you could, uh, a young man, a neophyte especially, could be uh, filled with pride. And then, and perhaps that leads into uh, falling into the condemnation of the devil. The condemnation of the devil here, the word is crema. Uh, for uh, condemnation, uh, the crema. Crema is, uh, is different than crisis. The, and sometimes they're translated the same, but there's the crema and the crisis. The, uh, the crema uh, is to come into, fall into, let's say the field in which the devil takes view and gives a judgment saying, now that's one I can get right there. Ah, I'm going to, uh, he's come under my condemnation. He's come under my crema. Now the crisis, by the way, uh, crisis is a judicial judgment. 
He doesn't have a judicial condemnation here. He's just in the eye of uh, the devil. The devil is going to begin to work on his life because of pride is what the, the, the uh, passage there uh, says. And then uh, in uh, verse 7, he must have a good report of them that are without. Um, you know, there is the... Uh, uh, the means of uh, pronunciating it a rapport as well, uh, but a good report of them which are out. The, the word report there, by the way, is uh, related to martyreo, from which we get witness. He's got a good witness from the outsiders, those who are not in the church. Now, it's questionable. Uh, does this mean other believers that are not in the church, or does it just mean the world in general? I suppose the easiest way to take this would just be, hey, the world in general. The, 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 the world should kind of like your pastor a little bit, is what it says. A good report of them that were, are without. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, this is uh, this one's, uh, kind of interesting here. Uh, he wants a good report, a good witness from the outsiders for two reasons. One is... He doesn't want to fall into reproach. Now, reproach from the world seems like kind of a good thing, doesn't it? I mean, you don't want the world just to love you, you know, rise up and say he's a jolly good fella. Uh, Christ endured the reproach of the world, as it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 3. Uh, but that said, if a pastor operates in such a way that everybody outside of the church just can't stand him. His neighbors don't like him. His mayor doesn't like him. His community doesn't like him. His, his uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, business associates that he might, uh, you know, the guy he buys insurance from doesn't like all that. They, they've just got a reproach. He's not going to make much progress in the, in the faith, is he? He's not going to make, make much progress uh, in evangelism. So, he needs a good report in order that he might not fall into reproach. Now, the, the person who has utterly rejected Christ, the Judeo-Christian worldview, uh, let him, I'll be reproached by them any day. Uh, you know, I, I hope I get under their skin a little bit. But the average person out there, the, you know, the guy I buy my gas from and the, uh, the lady across the counter at the post office and all those uh, people that you see on a regular basis, they shouldn't say, oh, here he comes again. I can't stand that preacher. That doesn't do you any good. Uh, so he might fall into reproach. And that reproach, I suppose, will lest will f help him to or cause him to fall, uh, or the, or excuse me, n a, a poor report will cause him to fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The snare is uh, the trap. Maybe even it's the devil's plan to uh, make the preacher uh, so grumpy that he's isolated from society. Say, hey, he knows too much about the Word of God. Let's just keep him isolated from society. All I need to do that is give him the reproach of the world and all is well. So the preacher ought to be uh, nice and uh, work against some of that just a little bit. Now, there he gives seven verses, not really long verses either. And in these seven verses, uh, what have you got? You've got basically, there's another passage in Titus, but you basically got the entire job description of the pastor. There it is. Uh, you know, this is the, his uh, character description, if you will. It's done right there. Because within the age of grace, the church, the body of Christ, has a lot of grace in how it carries things out. But there it is. Now, let's uh, continue on in verses uh, 8, uh, 8 through 13 is the section. We're going to stop in verse 10 here. So let's look at uh, three more verses. And uh, he's really continuing in the same charge, I charge you, chapter 1, verse 18. Here's the charge to men to women, now to bishops and deacons. And he's going in verse uh, verse 8, going to uh, go into the deacons and begin to talk about the deacons. Um, now, I think, let's just read uh, the first part of uh, verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave. Uh, he's not talking about the bishop anymore. He's talking about the deacons. 
the word likewise probably means, hey, if I already said it about the preacher and I miss it, let me go ahead and include it for the deacons as well. Now, this, this tells me that the church, the local church, has two offices, the office of the bishop and the office of the deacon. Uh, and I think that the local church should seek to emulate this biblical pattern as much as and as quickly as possible. I say as quickly uh, because a man goes to a new field perhaps and he's starting a church and it's just him. Uh, and, uh, you know, him and his wife, maybe, and the kids, and they're the church. Well, he doesn't have any deacons yet. He leads someone to Christ, some uh, man to Christ, and that man starts coming, growing in the word, and it's going to be a while before that church can have deacons. So I think, obviously, again, there's some grace here. But I think as, as uh, quickly as possible, the uh, church ought to have, uh, you know, a bishop, a bishop, and it ought to have deacons. And I said that carefully. It ought to have a bishop and it ought to have deacons. I think it's significant that everything we saw in verses 1 through 7 is in the singular exclusively, all the way. A bishop should be a man. Who? And it goes through singular, singular, singular. But when you get to verse 8, likewise must the deacons, plural, they must be grave. And uh, it goes on, everything in here is in the plural. It speaks of the bishop in the singular and of the deacons in the plural. Now, I, I think that, um, that, that that tells us something, that a local church should have a bishop, whatever you want to call him, and it ought to have deacons. And that is the uh, official offices of the church. Now, uh you know, there's, again, we've got a few verses here and a few others. The actual organization of the church is not expressly given, stated in the scripture. Uh, but I think, uh, I think this gives us a, uh, a good idea and a good clue to uh, what is uh, up there. Now, he uh, goes through some things, and let's look at uh, verse, uh, finish up verse 8 here. And again, these are things Paul gives no commentary because I think they're self-evident. Uh, he must be grave. Uh, the particular word uh, for grave there is worthy of respect. Uh, so the deacons, they must be, I should say, they must be grave, not double-tongued. Uh, that is, there is some integrity of speech. These are men that if they, if they say something, they're going to stand behind it. They are sincere in uh, their speech. Uh, and then it says, not given to much wine. Remember for the pastor, uh, paroinos, paroinos, to come alongside wine. Not paronos is what it says. Here, in uh, verse 8, speaking of the uh, deacons, it uh, says, may not oino, there's the, uh, the, the word for wine there, not to wine polo, much. We get like the word poly. Not to wine much. Now, Part of the Baptist in me will come out, and uh, part of the uh, free grace in me will come out. I think the scripture says, Bishop, don't get next to wine. Deacon, don't have much wine. I'll just take it, I'll just take it for what it says there. Uh, and, uh, and, um, you know, it, it is, it's worded in a way that I think irrefutably is less than, the, than it says to the bishop. Not greedy of filthy lucre. That's the exact same term, filthy, uh, that is uh, used earlier. Goes on to verse 9, and this is important, and I want us to uh, spend just a minute or two on it. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Ah, 
That's not even said of the bishop, though I would presume uh, it would be so, and we could probably use the word likewise to, uh, to bridge those together, but it's not said of the bishop. It's probably assumed of the bishop, but of the deacon holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. Well, what is the mystery of faith? I think the mystery of faith is the Pauline revelation. The mystery of faith is by grace, through faith, not of works, are we saved. It's the gospel that we, uh, that, that we preach, the, the, not the kingdom gospel, not the Torah law gospel, not the mixing up of all gospels. It is understanding the Pauline revelation, the Pauline mystery. Uh, now that means that we would typically call it right dividing. Those who rightly divide in the way we would use it, separate the Pauline mystery of faith from the, let's say, the, uh, the kingdom gospel that Peter was preaching. And so we, those are divided out. We keep the law over there and by grace through faith is over here. We, uh, uh, we keep, you know, uh, the uh, effort for the kingdom over there and we keep, again, this mystery thing over here. We keep prophecy over there. We keep mystery over here. We divide those out. Now, I think what this, what this says is, and I want to say this very clearly, the man who does not understand right dividing is not qualified biblically to be a deacon. And yet, how many of you would agree with me? Because you're already thinking it. Well, the deacons I know, they don't know how to rightly divide. That's, uh, it's a shame on the church. It's one of the reasons that perhaps uh, the church has always had kind of a love-hate relationship with the deacons. And, uh, and many times, uh, you know, pastors and deacons were at odds with one another. Many times, uh, uh, churches were divided over activities of the deacons, whatever it is. Maybe it's rooted right here that they were never qualified to be deacons because they didn't even know one of the basic qualifications is to hold to the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. You can't hold to the mystery of faith if you don't know what the mystery of faith is. Might I say then, and many of you would agree with me, most of the church has no clue what the mystery of faith is. And I would venture to say you could go down, if you've got a big box seminary in your community, go down to it and ask what the mystery of faith is, and none of the professors will know. None of them. They simply won't. Uh, Standard evangelicalism is almost always going to take this, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience, just to say they're spiritually mature. Well, if I remember right, uh, Paul had a way of saying not a novice. And here he says something different, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. If he, if he meant to say be spiritually mature, why didn't he just say that? Uh, got questions. Let's see. I think, uh, yeah, I've got, uh, got uh, them up. Remember, got questions. Uh, here it is. What's the mystery of faith? Got questions is the place to go to find the standard evangelical answer. Not the biblical answer, but the standard evangelical answer. Now, they go through and... Uh, uh, they uh, say, uh, let's see, that uh, uh, in the verse, the, this, this phrase, the mystery of the faith. Ah, look, I'll start earlier. I, you may not be able to read this. I understand it's kind of small. The mystery of faith is a term that incurs, occurs in 1 Timothy 3, 9. Depending on the English translation, the Greek faith, phrase, and it's got it there, is translated the mystery of faith, the mystery of the faith, or the deep truths of the faith. Now, I didn't even look to see who put the deep truths of the faith, and obviously they were too embarrassed to put it on there as well. But that is just absolutely uh, given an F on that translation. But that's not so much what I wanted to talk about. 
Uh, he says this first phrase appears about uh, deacons, and Paul's talking to Timothy about what sort of man should be uh, uh, entrusted with the uh, office of a deacon in the local uh, church uh, body. And he says they should be dignified, truthful, one who holds to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. Now, here's what I want you to note, and uh, I am uh, just going to... Um Make this a little bigger so you can see it, even though I won't be able to get it all on one screen. In this context, Paul is simply saying that the man who serves the church should be a believer who is mature, who has a firm grasp on the basic elements of the gospel and whose life matches his profession of faith. Now, all of that says, got questions, doesn't know what the mystery of the faith is. They don't rightly divide. And uh, if uh, got questions doesn't understand, we can know, you know, that's kind of the, again, the standard evangelical answer. Most deacons across the country don't hold to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience because they can't even tell you what it is. They'll just say, well, in the context, it's just, it just means to be mature. That's what it means. Just be mature. If you're, if you're mature, then, you know, you'll understand the gospel. Well, understanding the gospel is part of it, but I would say that uh, God questions doesn't understand the gospel. And so many others. Here, uh, again, the church ought to come together and say it is essential that the de deacon leadership within the church Hold to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. Now, let's take one more verse and we'll close from here. And let these also first be proved. Ah, if this says be mature, why does he say let them be mature? Let them be mature and let them be mature. And then once they're mature, they can be mature as deacons. Because verse 9 is not about maturity. It's about understanding and holding to the mystery of the faith. Now, let these also be proved and let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Same word for blameless that we had uh, earlier is, you know, they're not going to throw anything at them because they're ma a man of integrity. Uh, let them be proved. I think it's interesting that Paul gives no instruction on how they are to be proved. It uh, doesn't say, you know, here's the test they've got to pass. It doesn't say here's the length of time that they've got to, uh, you know, be watched over or whatever it is. It just says they let, let them be proved. And I think like so many things uh, in uh, the local church for the age of grace, that's one of those things that Paul says, you're in the grace. You've got a Bible, the Holy Spirit, you figure it out. Let them be proved however it uh, matters. I would venture to say... That's a very different thing, say, in Taos, New Mexico, in my church, than it may be in, you know, the big, big, big red brick church of Bigville. Uh, probably a different thing. Let each church figure it out. But let them be proved, and then let them serve as a deacon. And that's as far as I got. So uh, the black letters here probably turn to... Uh, uh, blue letters, and we'll finish 11, 12, and 13, which is on this uh, same uh, degree, and then we'll go into a new section beginning in verse 14, and by the way, since I read this right here, these things I write unto thee, uh, you know, likely uh, green or blue letters, he's talking specifically hoping to come to thee. He's not talking to me and you. He's not wanting to pay us a visit. Uh, so we may go uh, green on that, but uh, we will certainly uh, go uh, something different. So that uh, concludes our Bible study tonight. I do hope that uh, you uh, will uh, say hello. I got to reach over here because I don't have my mouse. There we go. Uh, and, uh, I uh, do want to say hello, uh, take a question or two if you've got it, and uh, let me say uh, just a couple of things. One is July 10th and 11th, I will be in Rydell, Georgia at the Pleasant Olive Baptist Church. I'm not sure if, if Pleasant Olives are green olives or black olives. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it'll be the Pleasant Olive Baptist Church, Rydell, Georgia. And uh, all day Saturday from, from 9 to 3. 
and uh, Sunday from 10 to noon. And I will be uh, giving a, uh, a series of presentations on the Hebrew epistles, the Hebraic epistles. Uh, that's uh, the book of Hebrews and onward uh, in the scripture and uh, showing where do those fit in our Christian faith? Where do we, what, what do we do with those? Uh, what kind of uh, applications uh, should we get with that? All of that. So if you are anywhere within uh, 15,000 miles of Rydell, Georgia, little uh, Pleasant Isle Baptist Church would be encouraged, and I would too, to see you there. Uh, and uh, if you wanna make a little Saturday, Sunday trip away, Come on down to Georgia. Look forward to that. This Sunday, I uh, have the regular schedule, 945 and 1045. I'll be back to 30 amazing uh, Bible stories you may not know at the 1045 service and our first Peter study at the 945 service. And I'll be uh, online tomorrow morning for Ask the Theologian. Now, if I may, let me say hello to the Benners, uh, having a blessed evening in Pittston, Pennsylvania. Jim in Piedmont, South Carolina, welcome. Uh, good to see you. Uh, Austin, Minnesota, Bob, uh, always a delight to, uh, uh, to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tom with us uh, on Friday morning in Cambodia. Welcome, uh, Dr. Tom, and any of your congregation may join you. Thank you for your good missionary work there. Uh, Bolingbrook, Illinois, appreciate uh, you. The Chicago area, Nicholas, uh, glad you're here. Neil, good to see you up in Vulcan, Alberta. Always a, a blessing. Daryl in Crystal Springs, at Mississippi. Tomato capital of the world. How are the tomatoes doing uh, now, Daryl? Uh, Wabasha, Minnesota. Roger and Maryland. Uh, great to see you again tonight. Keith and Carla in Auburn, Kentucky. Uh, blessings to you. Forney, Texas, the FEMA camp and uh, uh, coming out of. Uh, Chris, uh, good to see you. Greetings from Ohio. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. And uh, Debbie, also in Crystal Springs, uh, Mississippi. Linda down in Lexington. Uh, Beautiful green Lexington, good to see you. And uh, Rodney and Denise, thank you. Uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, formerly from Taos, New Mexico. And we miss you, we were talking about you this morning, Rodney, and men's breakfast. Um, you missed it, bacon. No, we didn't have bacon, we had sausage. Sausage, biscuits, eggs, uh, muffins, good breakfast. Should have been here, Rodney. <laughs> Shirley, uh, good to see you, Ridgecrest, California. Uh, made mention of you earlier, didn't I? Because I needed a California example. Uh, George, good to see you. Uh, George, Greg, I don't know where got George came from. I was uh, just uh, scrolling through there. Greg in Locust, North Carolina. Good to see you. Uh, welcome and uh, a uh, delight to uh, have you here. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I like that, uh, Dr. Mike or Lorna, I'm not sure which, Dr. Powell Preacher used to say uh, that church boards were, a bun were, were boards because it was full of splinters. <laughs> and it might, might be a lot of truth there. Um, Kim um, uh, in uh, the Flint Hills of Kansas, good to see you. You're right, verse nine would knock out a lot of deacons, wouldn't it? Uh, Scott in the hill country of Texas, uh, glad uh, you're here. Mark down in uh, Tampa, did I get it right? Tampa, Florida, uh, welcome, good to see you. It is a good uh, list of prerequisite characteristics or character traits for uh, leadership in general, you're right. Uh, Phil and Dreamin, Lexington, Kentucky, welcome, I'm glad you're here. Uh, let's see, Gerard uh, uh, in, um, uh, the Netherlands, welcome, good to uh, see you. Uh, Sharon, Russ and Sharon, Ellendale, Minnesota. Mel, good morning to you in the United Kingdom, glad you're here. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see, am I confused? Is there, is there a Gerard and a 26 Vino or is 26 Vino also Gerard? This is my question. I get I get confused there. Um, 
It hell, it happens. You know, at my age, Leesburg, Georgia. Uh, Jerry, always with us. Uh, good to see you, uh, Chuck. Uh, good to see you and Mr. P and the dog Hershey, all in Weatherford, Oklahoma. I hope the dog got a lot out of it, and the the, the two of you as well. Vina in Western Australia. Good to see you. As winter sets in there, um, and uh, Greg, did I finish saying hi in Locust, uh, North Carolina? I think uh, think I did, if I recall. Uh, Bev up in uh, Wisconsin, Roberts. I always want to say Russell. I don't know why, but Roberts, Wisconsin. I, the, the thing I can remember is St. Croix County, because it sounds so beautiful. Glad you're here, John, Bev. Uh, thank you. Uh, each one of you. Um, and, uh, oh, thanks, Dr. Tom. Uh, it says, thank you, Bishop Randy, for your wonderful teaching. You know, whereas I like the term bishop, I think it's like the mo probably the closest we can get to what it said. I, w I don't think I could ever get comfortable being called bishop. That would just seem so weird to me. And again, as I mentioned earlier, so, uh, I don't know, Catholic, Anglican, something, I would just, uh, uh, it, it, I don't know. I, I, I really, again, I think that's probably the word the church should have used. Uh, but, boy, it would be hard today, wouldn't it, to make, <laughs> to make that change. Uh, <coughs> Gerard, you're right. Got questions equals Calvinism. They are a, a very Calvinist organization, and the answers uh, there are uh, are Calvinist. And I agree with you. Not the place to be. Uh, they don't at all understand rightly dividing. Even though they will most often take, I would say, a mild uh, pre-tribulational rapture position. Uh, the the you know the only time I go to Got Questions is to prove to myself or to you that this is what the evangelical world thinks. Got Questions for me is used for research purposes only showing what they got wrong. Um, and, uh, um, and there it is. Thank you. Uh, the dog loved it. Hershey, I'm glad. She sat in her chair right beside me and never skipped a beat. That's a good right dividing dog. Uh, you should breed that thing. Sell, you know, a right dividing dog. Um, could start a market there. <laughs> um, indeed. Uh, Neil, does the Bible speak about time travel? Uh... In one sense, yes, you've certainly got John. However, that's in the spirit. And I think when we would talk about time travel, we would be talking more about, uh, you know, in the flesh. John is taken to the day of the Lord, the future great and terrible day of the Lord. And that's what he writes about in the Revelation. That would definitely be time travel. But again, that's, I think that's in, uh, that's clear that's in the spirit, not in the flesh. Uh, Ezekiel, on a number of occasions, is taken to Jerusalem, and it even appears, uh, at least I'll say the plain sense of reading it, is that Ezekiel himself was lifted and taken. And he was taken, you know, at one point even to Jerusalem future, millennial Jerusalem. And he's there writing it. As I recall, beginning in chapter 40 uh, through 48, I don't recall anything there through our last study of Ezekiel that tells us that um, it is uh, spiritual, that, that he's just having a vision of it. As I recall, he's there now. We should look at that closely. But there are a number of times, even before that, that he is taken to Jerusalem and he sees the destruction of the city. Again, not so much it appears in a vision as move forward and look at it. Uh, which 
you know, interestingly, and this some of this stuff is, uh, I'll say, above my head, uh, but it ought to cause, if, if I was a scientist, I would want to say, okay, is there that somehow that scientific ability, and I wouldn't even know enough to begin, I probably would say you got to begin with a theory of relativity and go from there and try to put put together uh, some theory, but that's as far as, as uh, I could go on it. Uh, it, it. Again, what would be interesting from a Bible study perspective is to take passages that appear to have time travel and see if we can scrutinize it out of there. That's what I would want to do. You know, here it appears like time travel, but is there something in the text that would tell us, nah, this is a vision where we're spiritually seeing something, but uh, not actually there. And, uh, you know, even going through Ezekiel, I don't know that I uh, studied it in that light. It would be a very uh, interesting, uh, interesting thing to do. Thanks, uh, Neil, for... Uh, Always the interesting questions that come from Vulcan, Alberta. Uh, beautiful farm Neil's got there. Y'all should go see pictures of it sometime. I should go there. Y'all should go there. 26 Vino is also Gerard. I was thinking so. I just didn't want to uh, continue in confusion. Well, Time's up, isn't it? I want to appreciate, I want to say thank you. I appreciate uh, each one of you for being with us uh, here in uh, Bible study. Whether it's uh, late at night uh, in, um, uh, on the East Coast or middle of the night for uh, those in Belgium or UK or it's already the next morning for those of you in... Uh, uh, Cambodia and in uh, Australia, or it's 8.24 in the evening for those of you here in the mountain states, uh, uh, or uh, 7.24, those of you over on the west coast, uh, or uh, let's see, I don't think Lynn is with us here from Oahu tonight, uh, but uh, if, uh, if Lynn is here, what, it's uh, three in the afternoon or something like that. Uh, whatever time it is, wherever you are, um, I uh, I would appreciate uh, I I do appreciate uh, you being here and uh, thanks for uh, seeing uh, each one of you. I Velus with Cliff. Uh, glad you're here. The Ethiopian eunuch was moved to a new place. Actually, Philip, who went to see the Ethiopian eunuch, was moved to a new place. And you know the. Uh, Let's see, would that be time travel? It, it, it would certainly be travel without time because Philip, he was told to walk down there, right? Uh, and, uh, he, you know, go down to the Gaza Road, the desert road. So it seems like he went in a normal way, but then he was raptured, shall we say, out of there at the end. Uh, and I suppose instantaneously then reappeared wherever it was he, he reappeared. And, and so that would be a sort of time travel, even though he's not going to a different time, he's not losing any time through that. Uh, interesting uh, issues that go there. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you. Um, and uh, thanks for Nathan on the controls tonight and all who uh, um, click the donate button every now and then, help us uh, uh, pay the bills around here. We very much appreciate that, especially in these uh, summer months. You are a blessing. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father, grateful for these who have joined us uh, and uh, so many of them, dear Heavenly Father, for 10 years now have been joining us uh, in Bible study and uh, what a uh, an encouragement uh, it always is and uh, we're grateful for these years of study on Thursday night and uh, you have sustained all along the way dear Heavenly Father and uh, we have learned so much uh, all along the way and sometimes unlearned a few things and uh, we're grateful for it and I just pray that tonight around our great big electronic table you would uh, uh, continue to bless us with a sweet sweet spirit dear Heavenly Father and the uh, joy and the fellowship that we have with one another and uh, we're grateful and I just pray your blessing 
blessings in your watch care over each one who is with us uh, tonight. Others who will join on the archives uh, later and watch this. Dear Heavenly Father, give a great blessing uh, wherever it is in the world that they are listening. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again, my friends. I would love to uh, see you in uh, Branson, Missouri, September 3rd through the 6th, Labor Day weekend. And uh, go to randywhiteministries.org, click the uh, retreat button, and um, send in your registration for that. And uh, it'll be a blessing to see there. Worldviews graphically presented is what we'll be discussing. And now, let's go have some ice cream. <laughs> we'll see you soon.